it's, it's good to be back in, uh, in the pulpit, and um, it's been a while since we've tackled Exodus. We uh, had uh, Christmas messages uh, over the holidays, and then uh, you had two wonderful preachers bring God's Word, Pastor Joel, um, actually two of my best friends, Pastor Joel on the first, and then uh, last week you heard... Uh, Tom Gillard, one of our elders, uh, he just knocked it out of the ballpark, didn't he? On mercy, I mean, that just is still just ringing in my ears. That message was so powerful. So I'm just so grateful to my brothers to have faithfully fed you. And we're getting back into Exodus now, and and uh, uh, we're gonna we're gonna land on a passage that's just right after the great Red Sea deliverance, and we're gonna land on a topic that actually you can believe it, is a major sub-theme sub in the book of Exodus in Numbers, because this is a major problem that the people of Israel had as they were wandering through the wilderness, and I want you to, I want you to know today, you are not here to hear a sermon that I'm preaching to you. I need to tell you, of all days, this ain't happening. You are hearing me talk to myself after God talked to me this week about this sermon. Because this thing has me written all over it, okay? Let me, let me tell you the backstory. So, at the beginning of November, I got a letter in the mail from our national office of our denomination, and it basically said that a pension fund that, um, that they had for pastors that my old church in California for 17 years gave into, that pension fund went belly up. And they basically had to close it out, and they were going to continue to pay the, the, the older pastors that are well into their retirement because they didn't want to drop their fund. But the guys that hadn't entered retirement yet, like me, um, they, when they closed it out, we were only going to get a portion of the value of the fund. And, I, and it was big, a significant amount. And I looked at this, and I'm going, really? This is my denomination. God, this is your fun. What's up with this? It's like, yeah, yeah, it's like, isn't this protected? Doesn't this have angels surrounding it? It's like, what's up with this? Okay, so I'm, I, I've got to confess, that put a little chip in my spirit. I, I found that news out uh, beginning of November, and that was really annoying. And then, <laughs> minorly, you know, like, Anyway, Cindy, Cindy had the baseball bat, so it's all good. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, and so then, over the holidays, you guys wouldn't, wouldn't know this, um, some of you saw me kind of limping around, so. Uh, but, uh, so after the choir performed on the 18th, and they did a wonderful choir concert uh, under Mike Allen's leadership, wonderful, choir, wonderful uh, Christmas concert. Well, uh, that next week, there was hardly anybody in the building everybody's getting ready for the holidays and we needed to kind of make some adjustments in the sanctuary to get ready for the Christmas Eve service well I was in my office studying working on the Christmas Eve sermon and uh, Joel get come pastor Joel comes and gets me and says John you need to help us Doug and I are in the sanctuary and we can't move the choir risers because they were up on the stage they were up, up up here and we wanted them they're put underneath the stage and so, uh, and those are big, heavy, old, horrible things. <laughs> I say that now. Uh, so, um, I, so I leave my study, come in here, and there's the three of us, and as soon as we get in here, Joel gets a long distance phone call from, from Iowa. Well, it's his brother. And you know at the beginning of December, his mom passed away. You guys also know that Joel's been going through some heart issues. Um, pretty serious heart issues. Well, Joel left, I mean, he gets me in here and then he leaves to answer a long distance phone call and I'm sitting here looking, so, and then Doug Fruit, who is a Christian communist, I mean, you guys all know, Doug should be serving time in San Quentin, uh, throw me the key. Anyway, I love Doug. Uh, but uh, Doug looks at me, up at me, and with puppy dog eyes going, John, maybe you and I, you know, can we? You know, and I'm like, oh, brother. So, and I feel bad for Joel, so I, Help Doug move the choir risers and put them away. All good? It was all good. No harm, no foul. Well, 
I could not get out of bed the next morning. <laughs> and I've been to my doctor twice now, and they've scheduled, he's, he's scheduling the CAT scan for me, and he is hooking me up with a surgeon. I gave myself a hernia. So, <laughs> needless to say, this sermon was like, I started working on this a couple weeks ago, and, I'm go, and I, it's like I'm going, okay, so what's, I forgot what the next section of Exodus was because of the Christmas holidays. So when I get back to the books and I read the title of the next, you know, all the devotionals I'm reading on this, it's like grumbling, complaining. And we're going, I don't want to read this stuff. I want to nurse my anger. Let me, let me pleasure. Let me have a pleasure for a minute. It's like, I mean, it's just like God set me up. So I'm telling you, today you're hearing a sermon that I'm preaching to myself after God had a talking with me, okay? So you guys can listen in, and if it applies to you, then you can take it and run with it. But, uh, but that's where we're at today, okay? So here we go. In Exodus 14, where we left off, we had just seen God supernaturally deliver the people of Israel through the Red Sea. And then we saw God wash the sea back over Pharaoh in the Egyptian army as they were pursuing the Jewish people. And they were all drowned, including Pharaoh. It's like they were all killed. It's like they, they were done. And so the great enemy and the oppressor of the Jewish people were destroyed. God delivered them. And it was a huge victory. In fact, like we talked about, this is really, when you ask a Jewish person about the great deliverance in history of their people, they will tell you about the Red Sea crossing, because that's the great deliverance. It is deliverance from Egypt and the Red Sea crossing. It's so big that Exodus 15, the next chapter, is basically the Song of Moses. The whole chapter is, is Moses' song of praise to God. Okay, it's, it's huge. It's like we're at the mountaintop. God delivers his people, and then Exodus 15 is this chapter devoted to praise and thanksgiving for God's faithfulness. And then you get to chapter 16. Now they are one month out, one month out of Egypt. Okay, let's get the context here. And there's a new issue. This is the issue. They started running low on supplies. And when they started running low on supplies, they did something that comes so naturally to us fine human beings. When you run low on supply, what do you do? You grumble and complain. Right? It it's comes so naturally to us. And that's what they did. Let's pick up at Exodus 16, verses 1 through 3. So they set out from Elam, which was just a beautiful place. Um, it was like an uh, oasis. And all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of sin. Not a fun place. I mean, you guys, it, when we were there in, uh, last spring, it looked like a moonscape. I mean, it was, it was not a pretty place. And uh, which is between Elam and Sinai. And on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt, and the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people, look at what they said. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat next to meat pots and eat bread to the full. Hey, we were right next to McDonald's and on the other side was Wendy's and we had all these food vouchers. And then you ruined our life by bringing us into the desert, Moses. For we, and so click on the previous verse again. He says, so we ate bread to the full and then, and then he says, for you have, look at this accusation against Moses, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. Wow. Wow. You guys are one month out of Egypt and they had just experienced this unbelievable deliverance. And here they are. They are grumbling. Their response to hardship 
was these three things. First, they grumbled against their leaders. Okay. I grew up in a wonderful home. My mom and dad were wonderful. They were wonderful people. I love them dearly. And, and I had a great childhood. But my family of origin had tendencies towards perfectionism. So let me tell you something. That when things go wrong and you are a perfectionist, what do you naturally want to do? Yes, yeah, green. What do you want to do? As soon as, if you're a perfectionist and something goes wrong, you look around. What do you want to do? You want to blame. Any, any questions? Can we close the fur now? That is, the, if you're a perfectionist, that's what you do. Because you don't, because the perfectionist says everything's got to be perfect for me to be okay. And if something doesn't go okay, well, I'm not going to take the for this. Somebody's got to. We blame. That's what they did. They picked the leader saying, Moses is an easy target. Let's aim our guns at him. Second thing they did is they declared that they wished they stayed in Egypt. Second thing a perfectionist does is they compare. They compare. Well, you know, the, uh, the previous leaders we were under and the previous circumstances we were in, the previous administration, it wasn't that bad. In fact, they were a lot more responsible than you, Moses. You camel jockey. <laughs> Actually, we met a lot of those. Um, it's like they were looking at their past through rose-colored glasses, and they selectively picked out the few things that were going good and said, See, you ruined our lives, Moses. You should have left us alone there. But you ruined our lives and we listened to you. And you deceived us. Isn't it interesting that they said, yeah, we had food, but they forgot to mention, oh yeah, we were under slave labor. Oh yeah, we, were regular, we regularly got beatings from the taskmaster. Oh yeah, we were working under cruel conditions. We hardly got sleep and we were all physically exhausted, and suffered from heat exhaustion. Oh, yeah, we didn't have any freedom. We had no freedom because we were slaves. Oh, and by the way, we weren't paid for anything we did. They forgot to mention those minor details. They just looked through rose-colored glasses at the past and tried to compare it to the front, to the present. And that built their argument for complaining. And then the third thing they did is they attributed bad motives to their leaders. That's the third thing that the perfectionist does. You not only screwed this up, but you probably wanted me to look bad, didn't you? You probably had it in for us. That's what they said. If you look at the passage, they attributed bad motives to Moses. Again, they selectively forgot. They selectively forgot that God had single-handedly, through Moses, delivered them from the greatest empire that was oppressing them. They had just blocked that out of their memory. And they were focused on this negative circumstance. They needed someone to blame. They were unhappy. It was inconvenient. They were worried about their food supply. And so they just went after somebody and attributed false motives to them. That is the anatomy of fallen people that uh, when things go south, they need someone to blame, and they need, they need to grumble. OK. Grumbling, grumbling is a disease in the soul. Hebrews 12 says, uh, he's, uh, the author of Hebrews says, guard your heart against the root of bitterness. They can grow up and defile many. The thing about complaining and grumbling is it's more contagious than the common cold. You start to grumble, and guess what? It spreads. Isn't that right? Yeah. It's like a disease. It spreads, and it, and it bankrupts our faith. It train wrecks our faith. That's what it does. 
So how does God respond to his people when they, they're one month out, they start running low on food, and they start just like complaining, they level Moses, they're like, they want to go back. How does God respond? Well, the first thing God does is he declares that he is testing them. He is testing them to see if they will trust and obey him. Look at Exodus 16, verses 4 and 5. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people should go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I might test them whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So he wanted them to gather twice as much on the day before the Sabbath, so they weren't working on the Sabbath. Okay? So God says he was testing them. Why was God testing them? Why was God testing them? What's up with this? Why did they need a test? Well, you guys, God was about to lead them into Canaan. And when they went into Canaan, they would have to conquer, they would have to trust God to conquer all the, the, the enemies of the Jewish people in Canaan. Not only that, but God promised to make them into a great nation. Not only that, but God was going to use them to be a light to the entire, entire Gentile world. So God was planning a huge destiny for this people. And before he would trust them with that huge destiny, he needed to train them. He needed to test them to see what was in their heart, to see if they would trust him and obey him. 